So this month we've been going through a series called Excuse Me God, I Got Questions. And, and we're looking at some of the questions we sometimes find ourselves asking God. Um, uh, sometimes you find yourself, maybe you're stuck somewhere or there's a struggle or a challenge somewhere and, and you're not sure how that reality aligns with the reality of who you know or you think God is. And you just find yourself thinking, ah, excuse me, God, I have some questions. The first question we looked at was the question of suffering. Why would a good God allow pain and suffering? And we, as we had that conversation, Pastor Vincent was leading us through it. Uh, I, I know that we shared that there are three basic truths that stand. No matter how difficult my life is, no matter what challenges I'm facing right now, we learned that the truth is this. Uh, we learned that God knows, that God knows what you're going through. He knows your situation. He knows your struggle. Uh, we learned that we win, that eventually our, 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 you know, the outcome of the situations of our lives have been predetermined. And that eventually we will win. And we learn that I matter. That even in that moment where my life is difficult, where I'm struggling, where I don't understand why God is allowing me to go through the things I'm going through, even in that moment, I matter and I am still important to God. On the second Sunday, we looked at the question, aren't all religions the same? And, and we learned that religion really are those systems we develop as human beings in our pursuit or in our endeavor to connect with our creator. And the lesson we learned was that those systems are all inadequate. It doesn't matter what religion you're talking about. Every religion is inadequate in the endeavor of connecting us back to God. And we learned that God's invitation to us is simply this. Forget religion, try relationship. That his desire, his invitation to us is, this is not about a system of checks and I did this, I didn't do this, so I'm a good Christian or, or a good Muslim or whatever it is. That really his greatest desire is for us to connect with him in a loving relationship. Last Sunday, we looked at a question that I've been hearing more, uh, you know, increasingly, that's being asked more and more uh, in our nation and our continent of Africa. Isn't Christianity a white man's religion? Why should I follow this faith? Didn't the white, uh, you know, the, 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 the Westerners, the people from the, uh, from the West, didn't they use religion? Wasn't it simply a tool in their hands? that they used so that they could succeed in colonizing us. And the lesson that we learned last Sunday was that the origin of the faith or the tools that brought the faith to Africa are, are irrelevant. The fact that Jesus may not be an African like me, uh, you know, was from the Middle East, whether this gospel was brought, uh, you know, by, by Brits, uh, I think it was for our, for our country here, or by whoever else from the West, we learned that the thing that matters the most is that Jesus has paid the price for me to be reconnected to God. That's what matters ultimately. And we learned that the invitation that God is always making to you and to me is that we would please say yes and receive the relationship that he's making available to us. So today we're looking at our final question for this month. This question is a question that uh, sometimes possibly you have found yourself asking it as a Christian, but I suspect it's a question that is asked more by non-Christians, people who are not followers of Jesus, because it's a question that is asked about us as Christians. And here is the question. Why are Christians hypocrites? Has anyone had that question? Have you ever heard that statement? Why are Christians hypocrites? And in fact, I want us to start from the very beginning. I want us to try and find out what does that mean when someone says Christians are hypocrites. That's a statement that I've heard a lot. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to share with them what does that mean? What do they think that person is saying? When that person is saying Christians are hypocrites, what are they saying? Let me just give us, uh, you know, uh, maybe one and a half minutes for you, for you to share and then for your neighbor and then we can move along. What does that mean to you? Turn to your neighbor and have a conversation. Christians are hypocrites. Christians are hypocrites. What does that statement mean? So here's my interpretation of that statement. I think ultimately the bottom line at the most basic point of it, what people are saying is that Christians pretend to be one thing but are really another. Is that what that means? That's my interpretation of the word hypocrite. When people say, you know, when they point at us and they say, you Christians are hypocrites, what, are, what, what they're saying is that you tell other people to live this way but you do not live this way yourselves. They're saying that the, that the picture you portray, how you uh, uh, show or present yourself to other people, is not who you really are when we truly look at you. To put it, to put it in the words of a cliche uh, that is, I believe is founded on something that Jesus said, what they are saying is that you preach, you preach water and drink wine. That's what they're saying. They're saying that the image you present to people is not who you really are. 
So the person pointing a finger at you, the person pointing a finger at me and saying, you Christians are hypocrites, could be a, a certain kind of person. It could be the son or daughter of a pastor. And this, and this man or woman sees how gracious and kind their father is to every member of their congregation. Their father is gracious, he's kind, but they know that back home when it comes to their family, he's a harsh man, uh, he's unforgiving, maybe even to the point of being cruel, that that's who he is at home. But when we see him at church, he's a completely different kind of person. And this, this young man, this young woman, they look at their father and they look at us as Christians and they say, you are hypocrites. It could be a young lady who was kicked out of the choir when she got pregnant. And she looks at us and she knows that her greatest accuser, the person who condemned her the most, was the worship leader who was another girl who was also sexually active. And the only difference between the two of them was that she didn't get pregnant. Or worse still, this leader, uh, you know, terminated the pregnancy. And so she's looking at us and she says, you are hypocrites. The person who condemned me was doing the exact same thing I did. But just because I got caught or there was evidence of my sin, they thought it was okay for them to condemn me. You know, this person who says you are hypocrites could be a daughter who watches her mom, who is an elder at church. And she's this respected woman. She's this woman that everyone looks to. She's the woman who is invited into every bridal shower to mentor and to speak to all the young people. Uh, all the young ladies in the church, because she, she seems to be wise and she seems to be excellent and a great example for them. But the reality is that the daughter knows that this woman has an extramarital affair. And so she looks at her, she looks at you and me, she says, you Christians are hypocrites. The person making this accusation could be the traffic officer who spends their day on Mombasa Road collecting bribes from Christians. It could be the county official who received a bribe from the church that needed, uh, you know, an uh, the process to be expedited for them to get their uh, development plans approved. In other words, I'm saying that oftentimes the person who makes this, uh, this accusation, this argument, Christians are hypocrites, oftentimes is someone who is justified. Often, oftentimes it's someone who, through their interactions with us, this is their conclusion that I have looked at you, I have seen how you live, and something doesn't add up. The things you say, the things you instruct others, the person you present to other people, and the person that I know are two different people. Christians are hypocrites. To help us answer this question, we'll be reading from the book of Romans. And last Sunday I said that the Bible book of Romans is really a letter. Um, uh, 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 they call them the epistles. Uh, a chunk of the New Testament consists of letters that were written uh, by the early leaders in the church. And the book of Romans is a letter that Paul was writing to the church, the followers of Jesus, the men and women who had given their lives to Christ and were following Jesus in the city of Rome. Paul addresses the letter to two categories of people. And if you read through the book, you find them re are referred to every now and then. Uh, you find him talking about these two categories of people. And these two categories were the Jews and the Gentiles. Tell your neighbor, Jews and Gentiles. So I want to put a little bit of context to our message and, and, and to who these people are, because I believe that it's going to help us lay the foundation for the lessons we will draw out of our reading at the very end. So the first question I want to answer is this. Who were the Jews? Who were the Jews. The Jews were descendants of Abraham. Somewhere along the way in the course of history, God had decided that there was something he wanted to do in the world. And for whatever reason, I think he decided, you know what, to accomplish the thing I want to accomplish, I need to pick a family. And so he picked Abraham and his wife. He picked this family and they became a chosen people. And over, uh, 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 over a few generations, over a few centuries, over several centuries, this couple had had one son, that one son had had two sons, uh, one son who was chosen, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and several centuries down the road, they'd become a nation, the people of Israel. When we talk about the chosen people, when you hear someone read, or when you read your Bible and see the chosen people, or you hear someone talking about the chosen nation, they, they, they're referring to the nation of Israel for this very reason. That God looked down upon the earth and he chose Abraham. Now, one of the things I think, uh, especially as I read my Bible, chances are Abraham wasn't necessarily special. 
He wasn't necessarily a better human being, quote-unquote, than the people around him. One of the things that always strikes me is how the relationship between Abraham and God starts in the Bible. Uh, in Genesis, I believe it's chapter 12. It just says, the Lord had said to Abraham. I'm like, there's no context. Where were they talking? When did that start? It's like, the Lord had said to Abraham. At what point? So I don't see that Abraham was a better human being. I think God was, I think, uh, God was in heaven and he's like, I need to do something. I need a family. Who shall I use? Okay, you. You're the one I'm going to use. And so Abraham and the nation of Israel, his descendants, this family, become God's chosen people. Because God had chosen them to do certain things through them, there are some privileges that this nation, the Jews, then received. On account of God choosing Abraham and choosing his descendants, they had received a number of privileges. I'm going to share with you three. Privilege number one was they received the law. Tell your neighbor the law. God, through Moses, had given them instructions on how they ought to live. He had given them instructions on how they ought to interact with one another. He had given them instru in, in, uh, instructions on how they ought to interact with the world around them. They had received the law of God. These are the first five books, uh, what we call the law, is the first five books of the Bible that God gave instruction through Moses, his servant, and he said to these guys, this is how you should live. That's the first privilege they had, that they're the only nation in history that received directly from God the law of God. The second lesson was that uh, they saw God's character. Tell your neighbor God's character. So through the law, but also through other things, for example, through various leaders, judges, prophets, priests, kings, and so on and so forth, this is the story of the Old Testament. God had given the Jews a glimpse of who he was. He had revealed himself to them. They had seen some things about God's character. If they were paying attention, you know, it's interesting, someone can be showing you something, but you're not paying attention to it. If they were paying attention, for example, they would have learned that God loves justice and that he often spoke about them living in justice. That's the character of God. That's who God is. If they were paying attention, they would have learned, for example, that God cares about the underprivileged in society because he was regularly talking about take care of orphans, take care of widows, the weakest of the weak and the most vulnerable and foreigners, by the way. So they had caught a glimpse of God's character. And the third privilege they had was this. They had certain rituals. Tell your neighbor some rituals. The Jews had received certain rituals that God had instructed them to undertake. And these rituals set them apart from many nations. For example, God had instructed them not to work on the seventh day. So every week on the seventh day, they did not work. I think because of how work is structured today, it's easy for us to assume this is a normal thing. But I want you to think back a little bit in history. Go back into those ancient times. You know, uh, uh, you know assume you're somewhere in the Middle East from a different nation, and, and, and you, know, you, you trade with these people, these weird guys, because they have some things that are different about them. And you know, one day you've come with your goods, you want to sell them in Jerusalem, which was the capital, and you get there and they say to you, we don't do trade on the seventh day. We are not working today. Can you imagine how weird that must have been? They were truly being set apart. These rituals made them different. They made the nations around them look at them and say, okay, you're really not like us. The most prominent ritual, by the way, was probably the ritual of circumcision. Somewhere after God had called Abraham, uh, just before Abraham's son Isaac was born, God had instructed him that he was to be circumcised and every man in his household. God had also given an instruction that circumcision would be a ritual for all the male descendants of Abraham, that they were all to be circumcised. Now, imagine having that conversation. Uh, you know, you're someone from Israel and someone from another nation, and they're coming and they're having a conversation, and you're having a conversation about, Ati, you do what? Why again? All of us, everyone in the whole country. They were completely set apart. So these are the three privileges they had gotten. Number one, they had received God's law. Number two, they had seen God's character. And number three, they had certain rituals that God had revealed to them or God, uh, and that God desired them to undertake. Now, one of the things that happened uh, as a result of these privileges that the Jews had is they started to think of themselves pretty highly. They realized we are different 
You know, we are the people who the law we live by was delivered to us by Moses, who used to have, you know, face-to-face conversations with God. You know, he would go and talk to God and then come and tell us, that says the Lord. You know, the kings, the prophets, they would go before the Lord and ask him, and God would speak to them. And they realized we are different from the nations around us. And so what happened was they, they started to think very highly of themselves. This is the first category of people that Paul is speaking to when he writes the letter to the church in Rome. He's talking to the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, these people who had been set apart, this nation that had been chosen by God. The second category of people that, we are, that, that he was talking to is everybody else. You see, the Jews had come to think of themselves as so special, and they were, because they were chosen, that now it was, it was us and everybody else. You know how when you're filling a form, you have different options, and the last option is other, and you have to define other. When you were filling a form in, you know, in Israel and you were Jew, the form had only two options, Jew or other. Like it was us and the rest of humanity. So uh, all of you are the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. That is who I am talking to. <laughs> if we have any Jews, we'd love to meet you, by the way. I don't know. So we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 2, verse 17 to, to 29. I'm going to read from the New International Version. Romans chapter 2, verse 17 to 29. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children because you have the law, the embody, you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Now, somewhere along the way, like I said, the Jews had looked at these privileges and they had taken pride in having received these privileges. But the other thing that had happened is that they had kind of started to focus on those privileges. By the way, the interesting thing is that as Paul speaks, he doesn't take away the fact that they have those privileges. He seems to affirm them. He says, yeah, 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 you guys are special. You guys are chosen. You guys are the ones who have received the law of God. By the way, Paul, as he's speaking, he's a Jew himself. And that's who he's speaking to. He says, we have received all these blessings. That's the first thing that he seems to do. He doesn't disagree with the fact that they had received the privileges. But there's something that concerns Paul here. One of the things that Paul notices is that the privileges had come to define the Jews. They had become the center of who they thought they were. And unfortunately for them, these were not the most important things as far as God was concerned. That was the thing that Paul understood. So Paul says to them, you take pride in the law. Yes, you have the law. It came to you from God. Fine, I agree. But having received that law, do you follow it? You know the law. Do you live by it? You know, he says to others, when, you te- when he says, when you teach others not to steal, do you steal yourself? In other words, the fact that they had the law, the fact that they were the chosen people, should not have been the priority. They had not been allowed that privilege just so that they could boast and, and you know, feel special uh, 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 among other people. They, they had focused on the privileges themselves, for example, the law, for example, the rituals, for example, you know, the revelation of God's character and had missed out on why God had given them those privileges. 
The privileges were not God's priority. Allow me to illustrate this point using two examples. As I was going through the book of Romans, at some point I came across some interesting stories about these guys. So let me give, give you two examples to illustrate my point. In the law, God had instructed them that at, that at any time you lent out money, you are to lend out money without interest, okay? So tell your neighbor, no, charge no interest. That was the law. The law was clear and it was simple. So because they knew they are not supposed to charge interest, let's say my sister Jackie here says to me, Pastor Jemo, can I borrow 80,000 shillings from you? And I say, okay, fine, that's fine. And I'd send her to my business manager. And you know, this, the, the, the person borrowing would go to the business manager and say, I am to borrow, you know, uh, I've been approved, uh, uh, you know, Pastor Jemo has allowed me to borrow 80,000 shillings from him. When the business manager would enter this amount in the records, they would enter in the records and say, Jackie has borrowed 100,000 shillings from Pastor Jemo. Please remember, how much money did she want to borrow? 80,000. How much money has been entered in the records? 100,000. So by the time she's paid me back my money, if anyone ever comes and inspects my books, they're going to say, ah, Jackie borrowed 100,000 shillings and then paid 100,000 shillings, which means she borrowed at 0% interest. So you see, for them, because they were stuck on the law, that was the priority. Do not charge interest. That's the law. My books say I have lived by the law. Jackie did not complain because she needed the money. She didn't say, no, 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 no. I write 80,000 and then you write 100,000. She's like, she knows she won't get it. So we all sort of agreed, okay, it's 100,000. Yes, yes, yes. You've taken 100,000. Yes. But in reality, she's living with 80,000. These guys have become experts at bending the law to breaking point. But here's the thing that they missed. God's priority in saying do not charge interest was not the law itself. You see, God knew that the likeliest person to need to borrow was a person who was in need. Someone who was desperately needy is the one who would need to borrow. And therefore, a poor person was the likeliest person to pay, to, 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 to need to borrow. So what God was doing, because he loves poor people, he cares for the least, uh, less privileged and the least of the least in our societies, God was trying to protect them. He was saying, if you're so desperate for money that you have to borrow, I don't want you to, I don't to uh, have someone, the person lending you, also add on top of you the added burden of a privilege to make for them a profit, and yet they are already wealthy. They already have more than you. So the foundation for the law was compassion for the poor. That was the thing the Jews missed. It was the priority was never do not charge interest. The priority, God's heart was always be kind to the poor. So if someone is desperately in need and they come and borrow, lend them without preconditions and without burdening them with an extra burden of interest, which means profit for yourself. That's the first example. I found that very interesting and very creative. Talk about cooking books. The second example is the issue of rest on the Sabbath. So God had said, you know, do no work, rest on the Sabbath. That was the law. Now, because these guys liked to figure out how to work around the law, they did something interesting. They, they, you know, the Bible says rest on the Sabbath, but I think, I don't know whether they would have forums, like where they would sit down and discuss things, but somewhere along the way, I think they asked themselves, so what does work mean? See, rest is do not work. Okay, fine. The instruction is do not work. So what is work? And they now started to, to, to break this thing down into little details. And so they said, okay, it's walking work. And they said, yeah, 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 yeah. Because if you walk, you can get tired, you can even sweat. So walking must be work. Ah, okay, okay, okay. But you see, you can't sit on your couch the whole day on the Sabbath. So let's define work. At what point have you walked to the point where now it's work and you have broken the law? So they had defined something interesting, something called a Sabbath day's journey. Tell your neighbor, Sabbath day's journey. The Sabbath day's journey was the maximum distance you were allowed to walk on the Sabbath without breaking the law. So now, let me, let me make this practical. Let's say this is my home. This is where I live. And we have defined the Sabbath day's journey. We have said that if I walk from here to here, this is a Sabbath day's journey. I should not walk beyond this point. Fine, we are agreed. Now, the challenge is that sometimes, I guess as life happens, sometimes I need to get something that's a little bit further. So here's what these guys would do. I would take some of my belongings, a few of my things, maybe a few items of clothing, and I'd, you know, move them from my home. This is my home here. 
and maybe I'd get a cousin or an auntie or a friend, and I'd leave a few of my belongings here. And then from here, I'd go another Sabbath day's journey to another friend who lives somewhere here, and I'd leave a few of my things here. And so if someone found me and I've left my home and I'm here, they would say to me, but you're breaking the law. It's the Sabbath today. You have exceeded a Sabbath day's journey from your home. I would then point them to this home here and say, but this is my home. This is where I keep my stuff. Because remember, they had moved a few of their belongings. If, if, in other words, that became their life. So you have a, you know, uh, your home is there. You have another quote-unquote home there. Because for them, the objective was not to break the letter of the law. So at any given point, I could be far from my home, but I have a place I can claim and say, actually, that's my home. Now, one of the things that's interesting for me when I read, when I read about the Sabbath in the Bible is that breaking the Sabbath was a capital offense. It was a capital crime. The punishment for working on the Sabbath was death. And I remember thinking to myself, but why, why? I'm like, I mean, I get it, murder, uh, you know, rape, uh, 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 adultery, uh, you know, uh, other big sins, worshipping idols. I get why those ones are punishable by death. I see it. I see why those things God make, uh, make God angry. But I'm thinking to myself, not resting on the Sabbath, why was that a, 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 a crime, an offense that was worthy of death? And here's the thing I came to understand. Ultimately, God wanted the nation of Israel to understand that he was their source. You see, work is the means by which I earn a living. Work is the means by which I put bread on the table for my family. And while the reality is that my effort is important for me to earn my living, God wanted them to understand that, yes, your effort is important, but ultimately, I am your source. I'm the one who provides for you. So when I rest on the Sabbath, when I take one day and I don't work on that day and I don't hustle, what I'm saying is that I'm trusting God that he will provide even without my effort on, seven out, on one out of seven days. And the converse is also true. When I insist on never taking a rest, somebody here needs to hear this, when I insist on never taking a rest, I'll never miss a bit. I'll never miss a day that I'm not working. Even when I'm not working for my employer, I'm working on my side hustle. I'm always working. When I don't have that day that I switch off and say I don't work today, essentially what I'm saying is that my provision is my responsibility. My well-being, the well-being of my family is in my hands only. In other words, I'm saying I alone provide for myself. I alone am responsible for the provision of my family. In other words, I am my source. That's what breaking the Sabbath means. That's what breaking the Sabbath meant. So the reason it was a capital offense is because when, I, when I'm living like that, essentially what I've done is I've taken God from his throne in my life and I have put myself there. It was equivalent to worshipping idols. I had made myself my own God. But that's the thing the Jews had missed. So because they thought do not work on the Sabbath is about do not work on the Sabbath, they had found little ways to work around it. They kept finding little ways to work around the law. And therefore they would point at other people and say, you must live like this, you must do this, you must do that. But the reality is that for themselves, many times they had found ways to work around it. Why is this relevant today and how do these stories speak to us today? The reason I'm telling these stories is because I see some parallels between us as followers of Jesus and the Jews this afternoon. We too have been exposed to God's law. We have instructions on how God desires us to live. When you look at the life of Jesus, the sermons that he preached, the things that he said, we know that he said things like love your neighbors and pray, sorry, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's how he desires you to live. We have the law of God. We have had glimpses of God's character. We know who God is because we know and we say things like God is love. We know that God is patient, that he loves us. We know these things, we sing of them. We have caught a glimpse of the character of God because he has revealed himself to us. 
We have some rituals that we undertake. We come together every Sunday for our Adventist brothers and sisters every Saturday. We worship God together. We meet in life groups in the course of the week. We fast, we pray, we tithe, we give our offerings. We have certain rituals that we have said, wow, these are the things that, you know, define us as followers of Jesus or as Christians as it were. We have received certain blessings and privileges just like the Jews had. But the reality is that sometimes these things, these checks, these boxes that we are checking, I have done, I have done, I have not done, I have not done, sometimes they become the center of our focus and we think that they are the ones that define us. And I believe that there's something that God is saying uh, to us today. So I'm going to draw two lessons from this reading and then we'll wrap this up. The first lesson is this, walk the talk. Tell your neighbor, walk the talk. Verse 24 says, as it, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is, a difficult, this is a difficult verse for me. Imagine the Bible is saying that there are people who will refuse to worship God because of how they look at you and what they see. Because of what they see when they look at me. This is a difficult scripture for me. That there could be someone out there who's considering becoming a follower of Jesus who will reject following Jesus because they see me and they will decide if that's what following Jesus looks like, I don't want to be a part of it. Imagine that. That there could be someone out there they've never considered following Jesus, but when they see how I live my life, it will make the possibility of them even considering following Jesus that much more difficult. The name of God is dishonored, is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is what happens when I don't walk the talk, when I don't live the way I am saying I ought to live. You know, the thing that God is challenging us here to do is to say you need to be aligned. When we don't walk the talk is when this accusation comes up. That's a question we're answering. Why are Christians hypocrites? It's because I say this is who I am and I know how I ought to live as a follower of Jesus, but I refuse to do so. If I'm a pastor and I'm willing to pay a bribe to a traffic cop and then the cop comes and sits here one day and sees me preaching, what do you think his response to my gospel will be? He'd look at me and say, this is a hoax. I know that guy. I know how he lives. I know what he does. You know, I used to hear single ladies saying, it's easier to date a guy who isn't a believer. And that used to stress me a little bit. And, you know, I probed a little bit and I found out, you know, they would say, because if you find out that if a guy is not a Christian and, you know, you find out he's cheating on you, at least you won't be surprised. Which I guess they were saying is, is a little better than, you know, dating a Christian guy. He looks extremely spiritual. You know, he sings in the worship team. He, you know, talks in languages you don't understand. He knows God so well. He knows even his nicknames. Only for you to find that there are three other girls he's been telling, the Lord spoke to me about you. <laughs> Pastor Jackie, you're feeling me. <laughs> this is what it looks like when we don't walk the talk, that the name of God is blasphemed among those who are far from God because of us. The challenge that God is placing for, before us this morning, if you're here and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, is live the way you're appearing to live. We ought to be willing to walk the talk. We ought to be willing to pay the price to do the right thing. I don't know why, I use traffic a lot because I feel like it's a practical example. Is that when I get arrested, I say, you know what, I will lose the day. I know, by the way, that most of the time, the issue is not the fine. Most of the time, it's the day. Yeah? The fact that you know this is going to take the whole day and you know you have that urgent meeting, you're going to be willing to pay the price, be willing to walk the talk. The first lesson is walk the talk. Tell your neighbor, walk the talk. The second lesson is this, focus on the main thing, okay? The Jews focused on the wrong priority. They made the law, the rituals, those little things, they made those things the priority, and yet those were not God's priority. The thing that goes wrong for us when we, do not, uh, when we don't focus on the main thing is that uh, uh, I want to share two things. Two things get, go wrong when we don't focus on the right thing. We honor ourselves and look down on others. Romans chapter 2, verse 17, it gives us a little bit of a description of this. It says that uh, when, Jew, when the Jews, we read that, when the Jews looked 
at other peoples, this is who they considered them to be. They considered themselves to be guide for the blind, light for those who are in the dark, instructors of the foolish, teachers of little children. Those are the words Paul uses. He's saying to them, I know that when you look at yourself, this is who you think you are. In other words, who do they think the other people are? That the other people, the Gentiles, are foolish children who are blind and in the dark. They, 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 they looked at themselves extremely highly. They had, you know, these bloated egos and a big head because they focused on the fact that God had privileged them. They honored themselves and looked down on others. The second mistake that happens when we focus on the wrong thing is that we focus on the sin of others and we ignore our own sin. The Jews had found ways to work around the law. This is the point at which you're called a hypocrite. This is the point at which I am called a hypocrite. They usually talk about pastor's kids. One of our greatest anxieties as pastors is that theory that pastor's kids are more likely to be lost than other people's children. And many times it's because the person I present here on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon when I'm preaching is not the person I am in my home. There's a phenomenal example in the book of John chapter 8, I believe it is, when they say, you know, the Bible says that, uh, you know, a group of people bring a woman before Jesus and they say that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. I have so many questions about that story. When you say caught in the act, how exactly did that happen? Like, was there someone peeping? I'm like, I, I mean, of all the things you can be caught in the act doing, it's not like anyone does it in public, right? Although we are living in special times nowadays, so... I'm like, how exactly did that happen? I know that the question the women ask is, if she was caught in the act, presumably she was not committing adultery by herself. Why was she presented to Jesus by herself? Where was the guy? You understand? Anyway, the long and short of it is that they bring her to Jesus and they say she should be stoned because adultery, the, 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 the punishment for adultery is death. And Jesus makes a most profound response. He says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all walk away. Because in that moment, they were paying zero attention to their own sins. And when, as they were condemning this woman, and as Jesus uh, looked, uh, you know, when Jesus said that statement, they all realized, I too am a sinner. When I focus on the wrong thing, the law, the rituals, the checking the boxes, I, 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 I look and focus on the sin of others. And I ignore my first sin. What are we saying today? These are the two things. Walk the walk and focus on the main thing. Tell your neighbor, walk the walk. Focus on the main thing. You know, the most important thing for me is as, as we've gone through this series and I've been saying to myself, what is my appropriate response? You see, it's possible for us to say, oh, I learned some interesting things about the book of Romans, or, oh, you know, I learned these, these stories about how the Jews used to live, and it was interesting, and, and, you know, and it's just information. It's easy for us to move on and carry just that and be stuck on just that. But I believe that there's a response that God desires from you and from me, even as we have learned these truths. As we've talked about religion, God's desire for us to be in relationship. As we talked about last Sunday, we said things like all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God pays the price for us to be restored to himself. As we're learning today that God's invitation to us is that we will walk the talk and we will focus on the main thing. What's the, the, what's the response that God desires from you and from me? Here's what I see when I read the book of Romans, and I want to sort of break this down a little bit as we wind up. The thing that Paul was saying to these people Romans 3.23 says, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The thing that Paul was saying to these people is, I'm not writing to two kinds of people, sinners and righteous. The Gentiles were at the place where they considered themselves close to God. We are the ones who are close to God. We are the loved ones. We are the chosen race. Yay! We are special. The rest of you are just attempting to connect to God. And so for them, they thought that there are two kinds of people, us and them. But Paul is saying, I'm not writing this to two kinds of people, sinners and righteous. I'm writing this to two kinds of sinners, religious and irreligious. I think Paul was trying to drive, uh, the point he was trying to make to them is, whether you're religious, you're a Jew, you have the law. 
This for us today would be whether you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus already, you too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the word of God. You're a religious sinner. What Paul was saying, for those of us who are not followers of Jesus yet, if you're here and you haven't made that decision, he's saying, I know you and I know that you're a sinner. If you sometimes find yourself thinking, oh, I have sinned, you're right, you have. But the message that Paul was driving home is this, for all of us, God has paid the price. And his desire is that we all would be reconnected to him. So let me speak a little bit to the followers of Jesus in the house. I want you to think about, you know, that man in your estate who, you know, all of you in the estate know that there's a house he visits regularly that is not his house when the husband from that house is away on a business trip. And it's generally known in the estate. I want you to think about that man. I want you to think about some young adult, a guy or a girl who lives close to you and always keeps you up and wakes your babies because she's always partying or he's always partying three nights, four nights in a week. And maybe you've even been praying and binding all her demons and everything else about her, evicting her in the name of Jesus from the flat that you live in. Amen? I want you to think about that sibling who maybe you've given up on because they've just done their third stint in rehab and they've had a relapse and you've said, I'm tired, I cannot do this anymore. In the light of these lessons that we're learning, what is, how would God have you respond to these people? I'm talking to the followers of Jesus in this space. Some of us, there are people we have condemned, we are even binding them, plus all their demons that, are, that we, we see or assume are in them. And I'm saying to you that the word of God tells me that God loves these people the same way he loves me. And my argument to you would be that this person is as worthy of your attention as he has received attention from God. That he is worthy of your prayers. That maybe what you need to pray for that party animal is that God would speak to them. That maybe what you need to pray for this adulterous husband is that God would, would minister to them, would change their lives, would, would fill them with whatever it is they are looking for in these relationships that they keep getting into. I put it to you that they are worthy of your attention. Perhaps you've given up on them, your work, uh, as you look to them, your response is condemnation. And I'm saying to you, if God did not condemn them, then who are you to condemn them? I put it to you that they are worthy of your attention and of an invitation to come to church. That sitting here, maybe all they needed was to sit here one Sunday this month to hear that God loves them. What's your response going to be? You have heard the word, you have listened, you have heard the message. What are you going to do with it? For you who are here and maybe you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, maybe your struggle is that I can't check all the boxes. My hope is that as you've heard this word, you've learned that God isn't saying to you, God is saying to you, I love you, I want you to receive relationship with me right now, right where you are. That God is saying, I don't need you to first move out of your boyfriend or your girlfriend's house. I don't need you to shut down that business that thrives predominantly on corruption. I don't need those things. Those are not pre-qualifications for me to be in relationship with you. I'm saying to you, come to me. I will resolve those issues for you. That you don't have to get, you don't have to sort yourself out, clean yourself up a little bit first. That I long for you right now right where you are. My prayer is that as we've had these truths this month, that God will give us the grace to respond appropriately to his word and to his love. As you sit here, maybe you're thinking I would never manage to walk the talk. So this thing is definitely not for me. You know, the truth is even as I say walk the talk, even as I teach this message, I know that even I don't walk the talk. I know that I too fall and walk in sin. But I know that this is the life God has called me to. And I know that God loves me and is merciful. And so every time I fall, every time I don't walk the talk, that his arms are wide open and I can go back to him in repentance. In other words, what I'm saying is that the place where we all belong, whether it's me, 
as the pastor, whether you, it's you, you've been a follower of Jesus for 20 years or two days or not yet, every single one of us, the place where we belong is at the foot of the cross, asking God to receive, or rather speaking to God and saying to him, we receive your mercy, we receive your forgiveness, and trusting him to make us the people he desires us to be. In Jesus' name. Let me ask that we rise to our feet as I speak a blessing over you. Let me ask that you just stretch out your hands as I pray for you. Would you consider inviting someone to church next Sunday? Would you look at that person, maybe a friend that you gave up on, maybe a neighbor who up until this point has not been worthy of your attention? Would you consider telling them, hey, come with me. There's something I want you to come in here. And then let's see what God does in their lives. Our Father and our God, I speak a blessing over your children now. Hey, Lord, would we be established in your love for us? Would we be established in relationship? Would we be established in a firm and a clear understanding that you have loved us with an eternal love? That my sin does not change how much you love me, my actions, my weaknesses, my shortcomings. It doesn't matter how many times I've sinned. Your word says in Psalm 103, verse 14, that he remembers our frame, he knows that we are dust. I pray that you will establish in us an understanding of how unwavering, unrelenting, unequivocal your love for us is. I speak a blessing over your children, Lord. At every point of need in the week ahead, Lord, would we find that you have gone ahead of us. Would you open the doors that we need to be opened? Would you anoint us with favor where we need your favor? Would you give us breakthrough where we need breakthrough? Would you shower us with your love? Would you fill us with your joy and encouragement where that is what we need? For some of us who are in a particularly difficult season right now, I pray that you will reveal yourself to us this week right there in the midst of our difficulty that we will be able to recognize you as our Father who loves us passionately and with full commitment. Where we need provision, Lord, I pray for miraculous provision that we'll be able to testify that our Father in heaven meets us at all our points of need, O oh God. In all things, Lord, we worship you, we exalt your holy name, and we thank you. I bless your children in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great week ahead.